Thanks very much, Fred. And uh, I think air would be a great topic uh, tonight, so uh, let's do that. One uh, just uh, sort of second uh, more introduction to Client Earth. So it's an unusual organization, unique in Europe, in that we're a group of lawyers organized as a charity uh, in order to do environmental work. And the reason it's called Client Earth is that we really see the Earth and all who sail upon her as the client. So representing the unrepresented interests of natural systems, of people's health, and of uh, animals' rights. Now, we work in a variety of areas, from uh, climate and energy, to saving forests, uh, to access to justice, <clears throat> protection of biodiversity, and then uh, the subject of tonight's evening uh, experience, uh, human health in the environment. And they're primarily working on clean air and uh, also on toxics. Now, when I started Client Earth uh, with a few friends uh, seven years ago, uh, we really were a small group. Uh, one of the first things that we wanted to do was to work on air quality. In those seven years, we've grown. Uh, we'll soon have a staff of 70 people uh, in London, Brussels, and Warsaw. And the work on air has continued through this seven years. Uh, at the very beginning, I was surprised uh, since, as Frank pointed out, air quality is an enormous problem in the UK, but also throughout the rest of Europe. I was surprised that none of the major organizations, environmental organizations in the UK, were doing anything about air pollution. So uh, I saw it as uh, an issue that needed to be worked on. And there was a second reason why I thought a case against the UK would be an interesting case. Uh, because the EU environmental laws are not very well enforced anywhere in Europe by the Commission or by citizens, I wanted to establish that citizens using the law could actually make a difference uh, in enforcement of environmental law generally, and then picked air quality and the ambient air quality directive, the European law, because it looked like it would be a good law to enforce. Why? Because as Frank was saying, there are standards. So there are numerical limits on pollutants, like uh, nitrous oxides. And there were timetables for countries to come into compliance with these health-based limits. Now, that's great, because if you have a limit and you have a deadline and you have good measurement of what the ambient air quality is, and it's good in London partly because uh, you just heard the gentleman who creates the data, uh, and he does a very good job, so we had good data, uh, we thought we could build a case. So, but before you sue someone, uh, you very politely write them a letter and say you have something to discuss. So we had a controversy uh, with, with the government uh, about whether they should be complying with the air pollution law. We thought it was very clear that since the deadline for compliance with the uh, NO2 requirement was 2010, and we were writing to them in 2012, we thought it was quite clear that they were beyond the deadline. They said, well, that may be, but we have no intention of complying until, oh, 2025 at the earliest. <clears throat> what can one do? Well, after such a discussion, really the only thing to do is to sue. So we sued, and, uh, <clears throat> and in the trial court, the judge said, well, I think this is rather European law. Now, to be clear, all European environment, all uh, environmental law everywhere in Europe now emanates from Brussels. But the way it works is that the UK and all the other countries go to Brussels and they agree on what the law should be, and then they agree to be bound by it, and then all together they pass it. It comes back to the member states and then it goes through the parliament. So this was passed in the parliament in London just as much as any law since the 12th century. But the trial judge said, well, this is rather European law. I'm not going to uh, enforce it. The Court of Appeals judge, having lost that argument against the guy who's now our most senior lawyer, uh, when the judge was working uh, at the Treasury and our senior guy was working at the Commission, knew he couldn't say that. So instead he said, oh, well, the law is rather vague. Um, so I don't think I have anything to enforce. Now, uh, anything can be argued to be vague, but as I was describing, you have a numerical limitations and a timeline. So insofar as any environmental law is enforceable, and lacks vagueness, this was it. So we went to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court, when we got there, was uh, slightly less than four years old. So a new institution. 
the Supreme Court uh, in the UK had always been a House of Lords, and uh, by go having a new institution to go into, we were in a, a really a very open space. No one, no citizens group, had ever enforced this ambient air quality directive against a country in Europe. The prior directive was enforced three times against uh, regional or city governments, but this was an entirely new situation anywhere in Europe, and we had a new court. The government stood up <clears throat> and said, well, um, your honors, you need to understand how it works. We all go to Brussels. We agree on what the law should be. We look very good. The citizens are very happy. Everyone has a good time. We then go home, and we implement the law when it's convenient, if it ever is. So that's the way it works, and it would be very unfortunate if you were to enforce the law against us. So, uh, and then the Supreme Court uh, said to us, well, you know, uh, we rarely give orders against the government, and indeed, uh, there's a legal fiction in the UK, I'm a solicitor here, as well as an American lawyer, uh, that the sovereign can do no wrong. So, uh, the courts rarely give an order, an enforcement order, or an injunction against the government. Very common in the United States, uh, very rare here. But we said, well, uh, you need to do that. And they said, but the government doesn't want to comply with the law. So what are we to do? Seriously, how are we going to compel them if they don't want to do it? So it became a very serious constitutional discussion. We realized we were at a, a, an important moment in the constitutional history of the country, really. Uh, this was the first environmental case in, the, in this new Supreme Court brought by citizens. And the argument became, well, if you do not order the government to comply with this law, why can't the government come in the next time it doesn't want to comply with any sort of law, environmental or not, and say it's inconvenient? At that point, you don't have the rule of law, which as a democracy we've expected for a very long time. Instead, you have rule by fiat and diktat. And the, the judges took the argument very seriously and essentially said, well, now that you've put it that way, yes, you're right. Uh, and they gave uh, an order against the government, a declaration that the government was in violation of the law. The next stage was because this was the first time that uh, the ambient air quality directive had been interpreted, the, um, because the commission has also not enforced the, uh, this law uh, in its NO2 provisions. Uh, the Supreme Court decided to ask questions of the European Court, uh, which any national court may do in a case of first instance, and it asked the European Court what the remedy should be. So a series of questions have gone to the European Court. The European Court has taken uh, arguments from both sides, and uh, we were told just the other day that it's going to render its decision on November 17th. Very important, because then what the European Court says about the nature of the remedy will apply in all uh, 28 member states uh, in the EU. So uh, although the asking of the questions delayed the result by a year, uh, we gained a great power of decision, assuming the European Court decides the way we hope it will, <clears throat> because then we can begin to bring cases in other countries, uh, and those countries' courts will also be bound by the European Court's decision on the remedy. So what should the remedy be? Uh, it's quite clear, really, in the law, if you don't comply, you have to come in to compliance as soon as possible and to write a plan that you give to the Commission to show that you will come into compliance as soon as possible. <clears throat> One of the arguments in the European Court is, what does as soon as possible mean? Uh, because you can imagine what the government is arguing as soon as possible means. And um, prior decisions that are relevant uh, of the European Court say that certain types of arguments just don't count here. So to say that it's too expensive is not an argument that works. Uh, to say that it's politically difficult or even politically impossible is not an argument that can work, that, that will work or can work. And is that unfair? Well, no, think about it. The UK and all of the other countries did go to Brussels and did agree to be bound by these rules, uh, by these numerical limits and by these timelines. So it's far from unfair. And the uh, question on what does the shortest possible time mean, <clears throat> we argue it's the shortest possible time physically so that you need to be able to put in your implementation measures. And Frank gave a great list of the type of measures that need to be looked at. The UK, when it decided it was going to 
uh, not comply, um, had the option of coming up with a plan to come into compliance by 2015, back in 2010. But what it would have had to have done would be to look at all of those different options and to say which it was going to use to try and clean up the air. It didn't do that. So now what the plan should require it to do is to simply look at all of those options and decide which of them in concert will make the air as quickly as possible uh, clean enough to meet these numerical limits. That's what we're looking for. And I think we have every expectation of getting a good result from the European court. What then? Well, being citizen forces, citizen forces um, looking to the horizon, we've gone and raised enough money to bring these cases then in other European countries. So uh, if we are successful, um, we have a couple of other lawyers coming on, we've raised a war chest, and we expect to, to work elsewhere. Uh, London is far from the only capital in Europe because of uh, the unfortunate infatuation of diesel that needs work. Um, and uh, good cases can be lodged, we hope, in, in many of the main cities in Europe. Uh, by the way, at the same time, we've been working in Krakow. The Krakow has a coal problem. Uh, it's a bit like here in the 50s. And uh, we've succeeded in getting the regional parliament from our Warsaw office to pass a law banning the use of coal as a heating fuel uh, in Krakow. So uh, quite an interesting precedent there, which will be relevant throughout Eastern Europe. Um, and it's enormously popular. Uh, with the people, interestingly. That's been very popular. Maybe in the question time, uh, we'll get into China. I'm just back from Beijing, and I, I found interesting news on the air pollution front. But um, I also, just in closing, would say that uh, cleaning up air pollution uh, is one of the reasons that it's very good for the UK to remain in the EU. Um, the, one of the best things the EU does is have broad and applicable to all environmental measures. Um, it makes no sense for countries, really, to be able to say one of the freedoms we want as a sovereign is to be able to allow our people to die of air pollution, uh, which I'm afraid is what would otherwise happen. So uh, remember that when you vote. Thanks. <laughs> James, uh, interesting you, you raise this right at the end, the issue of Britain and Europe. Yeah. As I understand the government case on these things, is that it gets very cross when the European courts tell Britain what to do <coughs> on the basis that um, we only want our British courts to tell mm. us what to do. But what you seem to be saying is they don't take any notice of the British courts either. Are your only recourse is to go to Europe. Have I got that right? Um, no, I, I do expect that uh, once we get the judgment from the Supreme Court in the UK that they, that they will have to follow it. Mm. And uh, countries vary in the degree to which they are willing to follow the, uh, an order from the, their own Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK tends to fight things very hard before it happens, but then comply. Th this is a kind of Northern European habit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's different elsewhere. But the, um, uh, the Europeans are coming against the UK uh, through the Commission bringing an enforcement action if the government doesn't uh, comply with the Supreme Court order in our case, mm -hmm. uh, the Commission has begun proceedings uh, in the European Court against mm -hmm. the UK, which could lead to massive penalties. Now, it hadn't. It could have brought that case before. And my sense is that we essentially embarrassed them uh, into action. Mm -hmm. So um, that case coming behind ours should be um, a real inducement to mm -hmm. uh, comply with the Supreme Court's order. And you mentioned November the 17th, is that yeah. right? Is that, is that a critical date? Is that one that me as a journalist I should be looking out for? And, you know? I'm so pleased you asked. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, mm -hmm. because um, that judgment uh, for purposes of everything we're talking about tonight uh, really is epical. You know, if the court says what we expect based on prior relevant mm -hmm. cases, it to say, then it will be possible for citizens throughout Europe uh, to bring these kind of cases and win and get countries put on a short leash to deliver clean air. Okay. 